And uh, before we, we start the presentation, have a little bit of a talk around uh, Flurry Sense and why we're really excited about bringing this technology into the, the Flurry technology ecosystem. Just wanted to do a little bit of, a, of an introduction. Uh, so I'm recently joining Flurry as, as the president. Uh, and prior to joining Flurry, I primarily worked in the enterprise, mostly in financial services and mostly dealing with uh, data and data management teams. So I used to head data innovation at Citigroup, I was a global head of analytics at HSBC. I've played similar roles at Deutsche Bank and Scotiabank. And so most of my career has been working with data analysts, data engineers, data scientists, so teams of people that are really tasked at how do you extract the maximum value out of data? And so some of the frustrations that we had around using tools and technologies to deal with data at the complexity of these organizations, these kind of big global financial banks, is what caused us to kind of think about creating new software, new technology, new ways of, of making it easier to extract value and get value out of data. And there was a lot of synergy between what we were doing and what, what the Flurry team was doing. And so we're super excited about bringing this technology into Flurry. So in terms of what we're gonna talk about today, we are gonna introduce this new technology called Flurry Sense. And so we'll set up and provide the context as far as what business problem Flurry Sense is specifically trying to solve. We'll discuss a couple of really critical use cases where we think this technology best applies. And then we'll do a deep dive by going through one case study. And then what we can do is we can open up the floor for any questions and any discussion afterwards. So if, if we start just from the top, if you look at what is Flurry's overall company vision, what is the goal for Flurry, right? So Flurry overall, it's about making it easier for organizations, uh, whether these are divisions inside a company or organizations and partnerships across the outside of the company's four walls. But the idea is to make it easier for entities to share data, collaborate and get the maximum value that you can out of data. And the core technology design principle is data centric architecture, meaning you really put data in the middle, you put the data first, and then you, you bring functions and you bring applications to the data, which is a slightly different design pattern from today where data is mostly kind of the byproduct of the applications, right? So you buy business applications, applications create data. And for the most part, that data was created by and for the business application. So when we think about how do we make it easier to share data, this is actually a, a pretty big problem inside most large enterprises. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is really focused towards kind of these, this business enterprise context. And for the most part, it's usually for organizations that are pretty complex, right? So they have a lot of products. Um, they have lots of functions, legal entities. Uh, so, so these could be kind of really big companies, really complex companies. These could be companies that have just grown through time via mergers and acquisitions. And so they may not have fully consolidated or integrated to common enterprise processes. And so you may have organizations where each business function might as well be its own separate company. Right. They have its own separate HR systems, payroll systems, their own different business process workflows, customer lists, order processing, et cetera. In many cases, we're seeing that this is uh, this becomes really challenging organizations that have lots of business application portfolios. So uh, there are many cases where each business goes out and buys its own software. So let's say, you know, one line of business goes out and purchases their own SaaS for HR and for CRM. Another line of business makes its own purchase decision. And as an enterprise, as a company, you look at your portfolio and all of a sudden you have hundreds of applications. And the final key consideration in terms of like, why is it so hard in some cases for companies to just share data effectively internally? Uh, so you wind up just having years and years of creating lots of data, right? So in some of the companies that we've worked at, you have hundreds and hundreds of petabytes of online data not to mention what you have on disk and tape, which is probably going into the, the exabytes of data. So in any case, what you tend to see is that inside big companies, it's really hard to find data. And it's even harder to find out what things mean because everyone uses a different vocabulary. And so some, some questions that you would imagine should be pretty simple. Where's my customer data? Or how many customers do I have? Are actually pretty complicated because data is spread out all over the place. Um, people use different terminology and different jargons to describe the same things. Data across different source systems that are supposed to be systems of record don't reconcile. So it's very simple for someone to be in one database with one name and address 
and for the same person to be in a slightly in a, in a different database with a slightly different interpretation of the name or the address. And so you don't know well, which one's the truth, right? And so inside many companies, it's very common to hear statements of, you know, our data is really bad. We don't trust it. I don't know if I can use it or not. So these are the types of things that really inhibit companies from being able to maximize the utility of all, all the data that they have. And as we all know, data is a really precious resource, right? And it's something that many companies will gain some pretty strategic competitive edge if they are able to fully leverage and get the value out of their data. Now, how is it that um, most companies try to solve this problem? Most companies try to solve the problem by investing in data governance and data quality and data management tools. And what we found is that despite making some pretty sizable investments, it's still very difficult to get value out of the data. So we can see here this one specific statistic from uh, an old HBR analysis where they went back and just did a survey and found really only 3% of companies' data met the minimum basic quality standards. Right? So how, do you, how are you supposed to become smarter than your competitors and create new products and services if the, qu the quality is that poor? Why is it that despite the investments in data governance, in tools and technology to solve this, we haven't really been able to kind of break the threshold and create large pockets of usable and, and shareable data? Well, the problem is that in these big enterprises, the data governance processes themselves tend to be pretty siloed, or you tend to use best of breed tools that don't really talk to each other. So in some organizations, the universe of tools that's required just to organize and get your arms around the data can sometimes look like this picture below, right? So you could be investing in data catalogs and then have best of breed data lineage tools and tools for reference and master data and have separate data quality tools and data classification tools. And in many cases, each of these tools and vendor products do one thing really well, but across the board, it's very difficult to stitch all this information together. The other challenge that we tend to see is that the knowledge around how do you actually identify that data is poor and how do you fix it and clean it is really in the heads of the people that use the data, but the people that normally fix the data are mostly developers. And so there's always been a little bit of a disconnect between how the data gets fixed versus how the data gets actually consumed. So as we're kind of looking at this problem space, we're trying to think through how do we A, simplify this process but B, how do we take the collective knowledge of, of the enterprise and how do we put it in a shape or form that makes it easier for data to get actually cleansed, remediated, and reused? So it was in answering those questions that we created FlurrySense. And basically FlurrySense is kind of our vision for how do we make sense out of vast amounts of structured data? Now this FlurrySense solution right now is focused on structured and semi-structured data. So this is the outputs of uh, business applications that create data and save them in RDBMSs. They can save them in mainframes. It could be as, as files that you're receiving from third-party vendors or uh, from legacy systems where they don't expose their data to be exposed via the, the operational data source itself. And kind of our trick here is to use machine learning to be able to scan the vast amounts of data that exist in the data ecosystem to be able to auto discover and auto remediate data. And we'll describe what that means by going through use case so that we can kind of provide a little bit more context into, into like, what does it mean to auto discover and auto remediate data? But the critical thing here is that we want to save the intelligence the machine gets into a reusable ever kind of growing format and so we, we're going to use a knowledge graph. We call it a data genome, but this is our way of taking the collective intelligence about the information of your data and your metadata and saving it in a way that it can be continuously enriched, expanded, reused. And then it's something that's great for machine learning models to be able to pick up and be able to use in order to get smarter. So we'll spend a little more time. We'll talk about the data genome as we as we kind of run through some of the use cases. And we'll, we'll kind of show you how we'll build elements of the graph and the intelligence piece by piece. And finally, the, the last way to think about what FlurrySense is, is think about it like a workflow or a pipeline that's driven by, by analytics that will allow you to take raw data and convert it into golden sources of truth, what we call golden records, that we can then share out and consume and serve out to 
different teams for management reporting, for data science, machine learning building, analytics, et cetera. Now, there's a common pattern for how companies have tried to clean data at massive scale. So the typical pattern is, and what we would you see in this picture is you have lots of raw data sources and you'll bring it into an enterprise data lake or an enterprise data warehouse. And then there's usually some process, we take the data in its kind of raw staged form, and then we move the data at different levels of cleansing. And so in this case, we're looking at a three layer model here, we're going from a raw copy of the data to a semantic copy, and then from a semantic copy to an integrated copy. Uh, at each step, the data is getting more pristine, you're providing more context as to what the data means, and you're trying to create the golden sources of truth. Uh, there's different models, we've seen some called raw, curated, and provisioned, uh, we've seen some use kind of the, what they call the medallion model, where you have a, a bronze data, silver data, and gold data. But it's the same key theme. The theme is that I've got lots of raw data. I need to create golden sources of truth. In order to do that, I need to get to a workflow. And when I'm done, I can then serve the data out into multiple different consumption platforms. So think about FlurrySense as an accelerator, as a way to use AI, machine learning, and automation to get through the process of getting the raw data into cleanse integrated data. So we can then push it out and serve it out for different consumption platforms. Whether it's your SQL analytics platform, if you're gonna be doing OLAP queries like a Snowflake, or that's for your data science workbench tools, whether it's like your Jupyter notebooks, your Databricks, your Azure ML, um, or, and when kind of very keen to us, we're kind of uh, thinking about using the Flurry Core database as a really novel and innovative way to truly share data across the enterprise with really strong privacy policy and control by taking advantage of Flurry's kind of Web3 backbone along with the knowledge graph. And so one of the outputs of Flurry Sense is that we create clean data that can be then served via the Flurry database safely and securely to the enterprise. And that's kind of how we connect the dots between Flurry Sense and Flurry Core which is Flurry Core is a phenomenal, safe, fantastic way for sharing data with customers, partners, different organizations inside the company. But it usually works well if you have data that's well described, well defined in RDF format. And what you've seen is that most of the raw data that we have here is never well described, well clean, well right, and, and, and defined and organized. And so really think about Flurry Sense as the pipeline for taking raw data and getting it into a format that makes it nice and easy to integrate and start fully leveraging the full power of Flurry for consumption. So let's talk a little bit about the Flurry Sense components. So there are three core components to Flurry Sense. Uh, and the three components, the three different modules make up the, the set or suite of capabilities that allow you to accelerate going from raw data to curated to cleansed in as fast a fashion as we can. So the first component or the first module is called ingest. This is basically our data pipeline tool. So if we need to move data around and we wanna have, uh, whether it's data moving in big batches, or if we wanna have real time change uh, streaming data, uh, and we wanna have workflow orchestration so that we can run these processes fully end to end from raw all the way to the end. So ingest is our, is our tool suite to do that. The next tool suite that we have is Classify. Classify allows you to take semantic ontologies and layer semantic ontologies on top of technical metadata. So in many cases, we have catalogs that make it very easy to capture the technical information about what data is being stored and where it's stored. So we can identify source systems, we can identify schemas, table names, column names, but the actual meaning is sometimes trapped. And if you wanna make sure the data is shareable, we have to put the meaning and the semantic context directly on the data. So classify, we'll walk through it, but classify is a way that we can take one or more data dictionaries and apply these semantic ontologies and teach the machines how to discover what the meanings are so we can put the meanings on top of the data. The other things that we can do within classify is that once we know what the data means, we can describe what is the business logic to determine whether this data is correct or not. We can now start scoring the data for quality. And we can also start to do things like, now that I understand what these things are, can I actually standardize or normalize reference data? And one, again, we'll give some examples of what that means if we go through a case study. The final component is called resolve. 
And Resolve is focused on really taking data from multiple da different data sources and integrating them into the golden source of truth. So in order to do that, we have to deduplicate data, we have to remediate data, and we have to resolve conflicts. So if I have two different records and I have one record that says that I'm currently located in California and I have another record that says that I'm currently sitting in New York, one of them is probably right, one of them is probably wrong, right? So the question is, how do we teach machines how to, A, identify that it is the same person even though the addresses are different, and B, figure out, well, given the fact that the data doesn't match, how do we break the time? How do we determine which one is more likely the correct answer? And the ultimate output of resolve is the golden record, the golden source of truth. Okay. Now, in any deployment, you don't need all three components. So in some cases, some, some folks may just focus on the, the metadata classification piece, which they just like to classify. Some people, people may just be focused on the entity resolution piece, so they'll look at resolve. But the idea is that as a system, the three components are designed to build and enrich each other so that every time you do something in each component, it gets added into the data genome or our knowledge graph. And that and each intelligence and each observation and each piece of knowledge that gets gained in one module can be used in another module to just make the system continuously smarter. So there'll be some benefits and values and we'll see in, the use, in, in our use case, how as you're kind of toggling across these different components, we can make it easier to address some really complex data challenges. So in terms of where is this technology really good? What, where is it really, really, what is it really good for and where is it good at? So the first area and really where this technology came out of was the classic uh, frustration around data lakes, right? So many enterprise and companies got really excited about the data lake. We went out, we bought Hadoop, we got hundreds of servers and then we started throwing a bunch of data into it and we told our data scientists go, I got your data lake. Now you don't need to worry about where the data is. But very quickly, people came back and said, wait a second, the data lake is actually a data swamp, right? Everybody could put everything in there and I have 20 copies of every single data set. I don't know which one is the correct one and what should I be using? I don't know where to find anything. And so a lot of this technology came out of, how do I reverse engineer? How do I get the data lake from a swamp back into something that gives you access to clean, usable data? And so think about this technology as something that we can literally put on top of existing data lakes and you can just take it, run it, and it's gonna try to go through and help create order and structure true data in the data lake. So that's kind of the first use case for where this technology originated. But we've also seen some pretty significant value in terms of legacy data migrations. Uh, in this case, sometimes enterprises are adopting a brand new enterprise platform. So it could be a new ERP system, could be in kind of an enterprise-wide CRM or HR system. Maybe we're moving to Workday. Uh, it could be a new product lifecycle management system, a new financial accounting platform. And in order to get the data into this new platform, we have to take data from the legacy systems. We have to integrate it so we create golden sources of truth and bring good, clean, trusted data into the new platform because we don't wanna take some of the legacy old data that wasn't very good and we don't wanna take that and bring it into the new platform. So this specific pattern of doing a migration is also gonna follow that same pattern where you're gonna to have to take raw data and stage it somewhere. You need to clean it, provision it, create the data and put it into the new target data model for whatever the system is that we're gonna be moving the data into. And so it's a great pattern for that kind of flurry sense use case. The third and final use case that, that we'll talk to today, and there's, there's many others, but the third one, the third big one is around customer data integration. And this would be any use case that really revolves taking data about customers, which could be multi-product, multi-geography, multi-line of business relationships, but being able to say, if I wanted to look at one customer and I wanted to look at all the transactions that they've done across all their accounts, across all their product relationships, in really big companies, you may not have a customer master, an account master, a product master, or even a single place to capture and consolidate all your transactions. How do we do that very quickly? So this is the, the classic use case where we can come in and leverage things like AI machine learning on the entity resolution side to quickly bring together multiple customer source system, uh, customer sources of record. So you can have many CRM systems. Uh, we've seen lots of customers that have 
you know, many different instances of Salesforce. And because each line of business slightly customized their instance of Salesforce, yes, it's running on the same platform. Technically, it's all on Salesforce, but it's actually not easy to connect the dots that a customer in instance A of Salesforce is the same as that is as customer B in Salesforce instance B. And so just bringing that data together, we can use the same pattern, bring the data, analyze it, introspect it, and then move it from raw to gold so that we can then have the data published and served out for reusability. Now, one of the things that we're gonna do to kind of help illustrate how we take the various different components of Flurry Sense and how we kind of run them through is we're gonna, we're gonna walk through a case study. And this case study is gonna go through a legacy data migration. And so I want you to think about this as a big Fortune 500 global manufacturing firm with many legal entities spread out across many different countries. And each legal entity basically operates as its own separate company. But there is an interest in having enterprise consolidation. So they do care about this data-centric vision where they want to be able to say, can I connect the dots between employees and customers and products and partners and suppliers and parts and inventory and orders, can we actually start to create enterprise views of this information? Now, one of the ways that they want to solve this problem is they want to do it by consolidating on a central ERP platform. And once they do that, they'll be able to do things like have a common bill of materials, a common products and parts inventory, uh, have kind of full proper masters of all their product technology and do the same for their customers and their orders, et cetera. So if, if this company were to kind of pursue a traditional legacy data migration, they'd probably follow a pattern that's gonna look like the, the architecture that we're gonna talk about here. So let's say I've got my data in my, my source systems, plural, and I wanna get it into my target database platform. In this case, in this scenario, the target platform is gonna be SAP, S4 HANA. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to analyze and understand the data. So what they may do is they may stand up a separate data profiling server. And in that data profiling server, they'll collect samples of the data, bring it into a separate location where they can run a bunch of data uh, prep analytics, right? Statistic modeling, looking at running some data quality rules and, and some business data quality logic, just to try to get an understanding of what data is it? What do we have? How much quantities do we have? Uh, and what, how good is it to be ready for us to, be take, to take it and move it into the target platform? And usually one of the outputs of this process is that there might be a remediation workflow. We come back and we say, let's go back and clean the source data so that, again, we're not taking garbage in and moving garbage into the, uh, to the target platform system. So then the next step is usually going to be, in order for us to start moving the data, we need to create kind of a staging environment. So we're going to create a staging data by server that's, that's a replica of the target environment. And what we're going to do is, because there's so much data and we have data that's going back, you know, in some cases, 20 years, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a, a snapshot and it could be a time snapshot or it could be a snapshot that's bounded by certain data domains. But we're just going to take the data into different tranches and we take one tranche. So let's say in this case, we're going to take a, 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 a tranche by time. So we're going to take six months worth of product inventory and order data. And then what we're going to do is, we're going to now take that data and the master data, we're going to want to create this bill of invent, this, this bill of materials master. So we're going to put it into a master data management system. And so we'd go, we put it into the MDM system and you start with the original master data. We create the cleanse copy of the master data. And then we're going to now run some ETL where we're going to take the transactional, the order, all the other data. We're going to combine it with the master data. And then when we're going to done, we're going to take the data and we're going to move it into the target model. And the target model in this case is the model that SAP needs in order for you to be able to take the data and load it in. And we're going to run through this process many times because we're going to have many different snapshots, right? So we're going to have to keep repeating and looping through this process. So we're going to create more samples. We're going to profile it. We're going to take more time snapshots. We're going to have to keep a, continuously appending and adding to the to the master uh, record for the bill of materials. And then as we kind of run through this process and we create more and more clean copy, we'll then start to load the data and tranches into the target platform. So this is kind of the, the typical approach, right? 
Uh, the only kind of bad thing about this approach is that a lot of this is really what we'll call transitional infrastructure. So data profiling server and the staging database server could have been infrastructure that you're standing up for this project to get the data into target platform. And all the insight and all the knowledge that you gain by going through this process could potentially go away when this project is over. So that's gonna be one thing that we're gonna to wanna to solve for, right? Which is how do we take all this knowledge that was built by claiming this data and how do we apply it to all of the company's data? The other thing that we need to think about is we also need to think about the time and the money for following this approach. So for the companies that are usually wanting to do this process, right? So let's say that I'm gonna take the first tranche, and I said the first tranche is a six month data sample. And so we run through the activities that I just described. So there's a bunch of data discovery, activities, which is including analyzing and introspecting the data, looking at the metadata, the technical metadata, looking at the, the data distributions, building data quality rules, uh, and then identifying what are the exceptions. Then there's usually the second step, which is a bunch of cleaning steps. And so cleaning is where you're going back to the source data, making a bunch of changes to the source data. You could be cleaning standardizing reference data values. You could be cleaning incorrect kind of mistyped entries. All the activities around bring the data into MDM and then applying and building matching and merging rules. Then there's usually a data mapping step, right? The data mapping step is we're going to take the data and figure out how do we convert it from the source model to the target model. And then we're going to write a bunch of ETL code. And then we can start to load the tranche of data. And then we start running through a, a post transfer validation and checkout process. And so in, in, let's say, the estimate to run through this was going to take about eight months. And to build up and stand up all the infrastructure ready to get this thing going, it's going to take about 2 to $3 million, right? So there's X amount of headcount. It'll take this much time. It'll take this much money to, to run through this just for the first tranche. And then because we're not doing this in kind of one big bang approach, but we're doing it in different pieces, so what we'll do is we'll then do the next tranche. And there'll be some efficiencies. So the second tranche shouldn't take as long as the first tranche. But the reality is that the, there's a lot of rework. And there's probably not as much efficiency as we'd like as we're going from each tranche. And so if we kind of run this for four tranches, now we're looking at close to 28 months of total elapsed time. So right now it's like about two and a 30 years. And you're looking at close to $15 million of investment on the upper end of the, of the estimate. So it's kind of looking at this dynamic and saying, wait a second, we're creating a lot of, we need to stand up a lot of infrastructure that's going to wind up getting thrown away after we finish the transition. And we have this process that's going to repeat many times, but that it's going to repeat for almost the same amount of time every time we run it. And so the thought process is there's got to be a better, faster, cheaper way to do this thing. So now what we'll do is we'll take a look at what the architecture pattern looks like when we use it using the Flurry Sounds approach. So same thing, we're gonna start with multiple sources of legacy data that we're gonna bring into the target platform. But this time, instead of creating separate kind of independent standalone architecture, in essence, the, this company already had a data lake. So we're gonna say is great, use your data lake capability. So we're gonna take advantage of the cloud economics and it's gonna be easy for us to scale up the compute and the storage that we need without having to actually physicalize and provision any new infrastructure in the data center. And instead of doing this in tranches, we're just going to do a full straight replica of the entire database, just bring the whole thing over and bring it to data lake. And by the way, we're going to set it up with change data capture turned on and set up so that it's a live copy. So as data is changing in the legacy system, the data is going to also change inside your replica, your live copy inside the data lake. And so we say, great, we're going to use that as a basis for doing all of our data transformation. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put Flurry Sense and think about as Flurry Sense is your cloud data lake management capability tool. So this is software that runs directly inside the cloud, directly on top of the data lake. As a matter of fact, it, the data and the storage and the compute will be the same exact compute that's being used. So whether you're using AWS or Azure or GCP, whether you're using Snowflake or Databricks, so systems pretty agnostic, but you're going to have your data here. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to put and load your data dictionaries, load them and bring them into Flurry Sense. And once that's set up, Flurry Sense is going to go through and it's going to profile, classify, tag the data, run data quality rules, and then we'll generate the exceptions. 
the exceptions themselves are just going to be data inside the data lake. So it's just another, think about it, it's just another table inside your, your data warehouse on, on the data lake. And then we can use that to facilitate a remediation workflow. But what we're also going to do is because I have a live replica of the source data, we can also make changes very quickly directly on that live copy. So what we'll do now is instead of bringing the data to a separate MVM system, what we'll do is we're just going to take the copy of the data. We're going to bring it into the analytic MVM capability within Flurry, which is the resolve component. And then what we'll do is we're going to do a couple of different techniques to create a clean copy of the legacy source data in the original source data schema. But as just another table, think about this as kind of like your silver table in your, your, uh, your medallion data warehouse. Okay, so now we're going from uh, our bronze data to our silver data. And then we want to very quickly create the ETL pipelines. It's going to take the data from the source data model into the target data model. And then from there, load it into the target data, to the, to the target system, in this case, SAP. And the interesting thing about this approach is that, A, by doing this, this is a workflow, right? So it's the same exact infrastructure that we can reuse across all the tranches. B, by going through this process, all of the information and the knowledge that was gained by going to the first tranche will get saved into the knowledge graph that's basically the underpinning or it's the brain of the FlurrySense application. Okay. So the idea here and what we're going to look through is the premise is that as we run through and the system gets smarter, FlurrySense will, will be able to take on more and more of the tasks so we can run this workflow with less people and run them faster. So the goal is to add more automation into this process. Okay. So let's kind of walk through and let's take this from this conceptual view, but let's go step by step and let's go through an actual scenario to see this in action. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna use the ingest application and the ingest application is where we're gonna build the data replication pipelines to bring the data from the source system and land it into the, into the data lake. Now, some companies already have their own data migration tools, their own ETL tools. You don't have to use ingest. Uh, so if, if you have your ingestion tool of choice, fantastic. But the whole goal is to just step one, just get, create a source living replica of the data source and bring it into the data lake. In the next step, we're gonna take your, your target dictionaries. In this case here, we're talking about semantic dictionaries, ways to describe the data such that people are gonna be able to understand what the data means. Okay, so as we're bringing the data into SAP, there is already kind of a, a well-described and well-understood data dictionary. So let's say in this case, we're looking at things like a bill of materials and a master inventory for product. And so there are already definitions in terms for what these things mean, okay? So in this case, this is looking at a catalog of information and the catalog is comprised of information at a business subject area or at a semantic object level. And then one level deeper, you have um, at the attribute or at the concept level. So in this case, we're looking at a semantic object called material accounting. And then material accounting is made up of these properties. You must have a material number, evaluation area, evaluation type, evaluation category, et cetera. Okay. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this dictionary. Now this could be any dictionary. So the idea here is to make it really simple for you to import or bring in whatever semantic ontology that you have. And as we're going to talk about in a minute, most companies don't just have a single semantic ontology. Most companies have multiple. So we're going to need to deal with the fact that companies don't always use the same vocabulary or the same dictionary. They have kind of their own, we'll call them dialects. So how do we teach the system to interpret multiple dialects? Well, we'll come into that in a second. So, once we have the target data dictionary, one thing that we can do is we can now start teaching machines to start identifying what we call synonym relationships. And a synonym relationship is when I have multiple catalogs, multiple data dictionaries, and we can teach the system to now go through and start to make inferences and see based on looking at the data, can we identify that terminology in one dictionary is the same as terminology in a different dictionary. And you can see how this is how we're starting to build this underlying knowledge graph where we're gonna be connecting technical metadata to business data, to business metadata, and then business metadata to other business metadata. 
And one thing that we're going to do is we're going to ask users to validate the inferences that are made by the machine. So users will go in and they'll give thumbs up or thumbs down, depending on whether the inferences are correct. All of these thumbs up and thumbs down, this is gonna, this is data that's gonna reinforce the model, but this is also added into the knowledge graph. So in the knowledge graph, we're now gonna have information that says, okay, this employee agreed that this specific value, the valuation class, is this specific field in the, inside this specific table in SAP S4. Great, we're gonna keep track of the fact that that person voted that way. And over time, we're gonna see how everyone in the company is providing their feedback. And based on that, we're gonna learn who really understands this data well and who should we trust. Okay, so the goal is to start collecting and saving every single action that's being done as new ways to enrich the knowledge graph, what we call the data genome. So we continuously have more and more information about what does this data mean? and What do employees know about this data? The next thing that we're gonna do is we're now gonna be able to, because we've defined what things mean, we can now start to define at a semantic level, the business rules that define whether the data is good or not. So let's say for example, that here we're looking at something called the valuation class and valuation class, there's only four specific valid values for a valuation class, right? It's either A, B, C, or D. So what we can do is we can start to define and say things that are valuation classes must be A, B, C, or D in order for them to be valid. And when we define this rule at a semantic level, what this allows us to do is this allows us to go back, scan the data lake and say, if you find anything that's considered a valuation class and you feel pretty confident it's a valuation class, go ahead and see how many records in that specific column or in that data set meet this data quality rule. Okay. So this allows us to kind of not only quickly scan data and identify meaning, but start to very quickly, without having to write the rules for each individual system, a way to write the rule once such that we can apply it to any table where it appears in the data lake. And this could be pretty complex and sophisticated logic. So you, have a, a, you can have a pretty sophisticated and complex rules engine here. But what the rules engine will do is it will translate the semantic logic that we're describing here in English into detailed technical queries. So if I find valuation class in five different tables and the, in order to execute the rule, I need to join data from multiple tables because maybe in one data source, the data is denormalized, the data is highly normalized. And therefore in order to execute the rule, I need to do a lookup against another table. So all of those details on how do you actually translate the business logic into technical logic is handled by the engine. Now, one thing that we need to do is we need to actually train the classification model, right? We need to teach the model. So what is valuation class, right? And how do you find valuation class anywhere uh, in the data lake? So one way to do it is through mappings, right? So if you're familiar with any kind of uh, data mapping software, whether this is like Erwin, uh, Informatica mapping tools. So we just, it's a, a simple mapping where you've got your source model on the left side, you've got the model that you're trying to map to on the right side, you do a drag and drop. And in this case, we're gonna identify that we have this one specific attribute here called valuation class from this data set called valuation class. And this is a good example of the valuation class concept. And we're gonna save that as a mapping. So when we're done, we have this mapping and the idea is to keep building more and more mappings and adding these mappings into your knowledge graph. So in your knowledge graph, at some point, you'll now start to see there's lots of mappings, right? And the more mappings we have, the better and the smarter the system will be in terms of trying to figure out how to use those mappings and use that, and that, that data as training to go and find the data in the data lake. So in this scenario here, we've started to bring in all kinds of mappings on material accounting data. Okay. Now, in some cases, you can either kind of drag and drop through the UI, or we make it pretty easy to just take an extract from Erwin or take an extract from other tools, save it in a specific template, and then import the mappings. So in most cases, a lot of what we're doing is we're just taking a lot of existing enterprise architecture artifacts 
just doing some quick reformulation of the CSV file, loading the CSV file, and that will get the system trained with whatever knowledge that someone's kind of gone through and put in. The next thing that we're gonna do now is we're gonna say, great, now that I've taught you or I've trained you what material accounting means, because I've given you some examples of what good material accounting data looks like, I need you to go out now and go find material accounting data everywhere in the data lake. And so in your data lake, you could have data from multiple different source systems. It could be in Hadoop, it could be in S3. You can go out and ping the relational databases. So go and ping Oracle, connect to Snowflake. But the idea here is now that we've got access to all this information, we can tell Flurry Sense to go through and now start scan and profile every single data set from every single data source. And what it will do is it will start to create a profile that looks like this for, for each individual data set. So here we've gone through one data set. This is a data set from the legacy ERP system. Here on the left side, we'll see that it has, you know, whatever different technical metadata. So what are the attributes in it? For this specific attribute called the item description, the best association or the best tag is material description. And the system is 82% confident that that is what it is. And in the middle, it's showing you some of the statistical profile information that was generated for that specific column. And again, the goal here is to say as SMEs, so people who are using this data set, as they use the data set, they may either agree or disagree with whether this is a correct classification. So as they do that, we ask users to go in and update, just tag it as I agree or I disagree. If I disagree, the system says, okay, if this is not a material description, what do you think it is? And we save all this information into the data genome in the knowledge graph. And then this is how we're gonna continuously reinforce the system's knowledge. And this is how the system is gonna improve and get smarter over time. The other thing that we've done is the second that we've tagged and we've classified the data, if there's high confidence that we know what the data is and we've described the semantic business logic to describe whether the data is good or bad, we can automatically start running data quality scoring right away. So here you'll be able to go in, go into data quality profile within the uh, within your data set, look at each individual column that's been scored, look at the rules, look at the exceptions. And the goal is to make it as, as quick as possible to identify what's wrong with this data so that we can either provide instructions to go back and make fixes to the source system, or so that we can actually use this as knowledge to train the machine, to teach the machine how to fix it directly. The next step is going to be that we need to, now that the machine understands what the data is, can we teach the machine to look at how the data is structured and can the system take a first pass at doing the source to target mapping? So in this case, the system is analyzing and introspecting the data. It's trying to identify primary keys and foreign keys. And it's going to come back and say, if I wanted to create a single view, a flat and denormalized view of the data set based on whatever the semantic ontology, whatever object that we're looking at, the system will try to take a first pass at creating what that ETL logic is going to be. And if we click on the Publish Semantic Data Sets button, it will further automatically generate the ETL pipeline and then just. So now it's going to come back and say, if we wanted to take this data and convert this into the material accounting table, I'm going to need to join data from three or four different tables. And we've kind of taken the first pass at working through the logic for how to connect and bring that data together. So instead of having people writing, trying to code the ETL from scratch, we can now have the machine take a good first pass at it and then have the analyst go in and add and tweak it with any specific business logic nuances that are not discoverable by the data. Next thing that we need to do is we may come back and say, great, I now have the data in the target data form but maybe the data values don't match. So as we were going through and introspecting and analyzing the data quality exceptions, maybe we have a rule set that says, look, we're expecting values from a valid values list. And the next thing that we could do is within classify is to teach the machine how to scan each individual record, look at the properties and identify what is the best, most likely reference data value that we can use to standardize the data. So in this example that we have here, there is a specific valid values list in the reference data for describing a material class. 
And what we need to do is we need to have the machine read the description of the material of the product. And then based on that, identify which reference data value does the machine think is the best one that best describes this specific product. And you can see here how it's making its predictions. And for each prediction, you'll be able to go in and see what the confidence level. So in this case, this specific one, the system is 60-some is percent confident that this is a beaker. And then we can, again, have individuals go in and provide feedback. And you'll see that not all the feedback is going to be uh, in agreement or there won't always be consensus. So over time, as a system builds its knowledge graph, the system will start to get pretty smart and trying to figure out how to disambiguate conflicting feedback and how to deal with, um, you know, based on the fact that this person gave me thumbs up and I'm starting to see where in which domains people agree or disagree, we can now start to see how trustworthy that individual is and how much I should weight their feedback versus someone else. The other challenge in normalizing the data could be that I may have a lot of data that's in this one big field that's completely like semi-structured freeform text. And what I really need to do is in order for me to convert this into the standard format, I need to take this semi-structured data, I need to parse it and convert it into standardized structured form. So in this example here, we've got this specific product, which has a detailed description, but the system is identifying that in this definition here, the one quarter inch is, refer is referring to thickness, that the material here is the carbon steel, that the color is black. So again, we're trying to build a natural language processing model that will learn how to read through and introspect the data and then take a first pass at identifying how to flag it. And then again, through thumbs up and thumbs down, reinforce the model. And the way that we teach it is we need SMEs to go in and look at an example and physically tag it. So in this example, someone, someone went in and said, here's an example of one product. Iron alloy is the material. In this specific case, two inches represents size and outlet conduit rigid is describing additional features. So now we take this and this is, this is here, as you can see, it's called a training task. By, by a subject matter expert going in and putting this information into the system, this is how it's teaching the machine how to go through, scan the data, and then convert and parse semi-structured data into structured data in some kind of reference data form. Now, let's say we go through all this process and we've now created data sources where we've gone through each individual data source and we've tagged it to the target model uh, we've kind of cleansed the data to the reference data standards. But the next thing is that two different data sources may be describing the same entity, but may not agree with what the val what the true information about that entity is. So in this example here, we're going to look at a specific entity resolution project in Resolve, which is looking at taking one of the materials that's produced by the manufacturing company. In this case, they're looking at wind turbines. And so they've defined a semantic ontology specific to wind turbines. And they're going to take data from multiple different data sources. So there's an asset inventory. They have their SCADA on their control system. There's like third-party reference data from the wind turbine model database. So we're going to bring all this data together. And we're going to say, can we identify how many distinct types of turbines are there across all these systems so that we can create proper wind turbine master data? So in this example here, this, the machine has scanned through all the, the contents and it's come back and said, we found this many unique types of turbines and we've consolidated all the records across all the source systems that we think relate to the same exact turbine. So in this case, we found all these different instances of the same turbine or what the machine believes to be the same turbine type across many different locations and sites. How do we teach the machine in order to improve its confidence and have it do a better job of making sure that it's correctly grouping together the records that are of the same entity type? So again, we take it through a training task. In this case, the training task, the system will show you one type of a turbine, and then it's gonna show a couple of other records of different types or what the machine, what the machine perceived to be different types. And it will ask a subject matter expert, 
Are these the same? Are they a match or are they not a match? And so the, the subject matter expert will review the different records across the different sources. And then based on that, they'll come back and say, hey, these things are really the same or these things are not the same. These things are really different. And the system is going to try to figure out and learn the logic to say what needs to match in order for us to identify that these two things are the same, right? With an understanding that not everything is always going to match. Um, otherwise, it would be very easy to group this stuff together. Once we've done that, the next thing that we need to do is we need to now consolidate or merge all the data into the golden records, right? The golden sources of truth. So in this example here, we've taken that one record or that one entity for this specific turbine type. And this record in the middle is the machine generated golden record. And for each individual attribute, the machine is going through and looking at what were all the possible choices scoring them and picking a choice. So for example, we have this one attribute called, what is the above ground level that's being reported to the FAA, the Federal Aviation uh, uh, Administration? In one system, it's 126.52. In another, it's 126.83. In another, it's written as 127 feet. And the system has scored it and said, based on what I've been taught and how I can learn, we can score it and say the most likely best answer is 126.52. And again, you can give thumbs up and thumbs down if you agree or disagree. And based on how you're providing that feedback, this all gets added into the knowledge graph. And then from there, the system will go through and it will update and rerun and rebuild and calibrate its model. Once this is done, we're at step 10, where we can now publish the golden records. So at this point, we've now generated a master record for each individual turbine, for each product. We've tagged it to the, re the reference data that we've normalized. And one thing that we'll be able to do is because this record was, was created by combining different pieces of information across different records, we can now trace the lineage. If I look at the lineage, we'll be able to see which attributes came from which specific source records, which are, which are highlighted or color coded in yellow. And again, all of this is added to the knowledge graph. So in the knowledge graph, we'll have the golden record and we'll have a link or a pointer for every single record in the golden record as to which record preceded it. So we have that, that connectivity and we'll have that lineage and traceability directly built into the knowledge graph. Which means that the final step is that we can now take the data and then run a final uh, pipeline to take the data and just move it into the target platform. Now we're, we've only got about five minutes left, so I'm just going to quickly run through the the remaining the, the remainder here. But the idea here is that we can take this pipeline, and with this pipeline, it'll take about four months to run, and it's about one to one and a half million dollars worth of investment. But what you see the real value add is that each successive tranche gets smaller, and you don't need to run as many tranches. <clears throat> so here we're taking a process that would have taken 28 months, and we've cut it now down to 12 months. You're taking something that was in the orders of around 10 to $15 million and you brought it down to about two to three. So that's gonna be the kind of the ultimate vision is to, to be able to run this now as a process. But when we're done with this transformation, all that knowledge that was built in, the data quality rules, the thumbs up and the thumbs down at every step of the way, it's all built into this data genome, which is your knowledge graph. And it's still sitting there on the data lake so that anytime you put in any new data into the data lake, you should now be able to run through and scan it, tag it, normalize it, because we've already taught the machine how to do things. So just to kind of close up, so we did, we kind of ran through a kind of a, a big complex workflow to take data and just move it from raw data all the way to golden reusable cleanse data. But really this comes back to the core principle of saying, now that we have this data, it's self-describable data, I now have the data with the ontologies and I can save it in RDF. I can save it and load as JSON LD and bring it right into the Flurry system. Think about Flurry Sense as the pipeline to get your data ready for Flurry. This type of pipeline has some really material impacts to projects like Customer 360 for doing things like reclaiming back the data lake if it turned into a data swamp or for doing things like this legacy migration into a new ERP platform, new accounting platform. And ultimately the goal here in the vision is that 
Once Floresense is done and worked through its pipeline, it's created RDF, JSON, LD, ready, describable data that we can now apply policy and control and distribute it broadly through the FlareDB. So I know we didn't, I apologize that uh, I didn't leave a lot of time for our questions. Um, I don't know, Kevin, if we wanted to, to see if we can take on kind of one or a few questions or, or take on some comments from the broader group. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Elliot. And thanks everybody for your participation and questions. I'll just go right down the line here. Um, Deepak asks, uh, is this platform capable of doing analytics on unstructured data as well? Looks like they get PDF financial statements as input. Yeah, so right now we've been primarily focused on the structured side. We have different partners that we work with on the Flurry as part of the Flurry ecosystem for unstructured data. So yeah. what we're doing is we're just, Flurry Sense is really focused on closing the hole with structured data. Yeah, I'll also just mention, Elliot, we, we did a webinar with a company in our ecosystem called uh, Text Distill, where they showed applying a semantic ontology to a PDF and abstracting uh, the relationships of the data into a Flurry core database. So that is certainly possible within our ecosystem. Um, let's see here. Bradley asks, is Flurry Sense Classify similar to a data catalog? Yeah, so it is in the sense that uh, uh, it allows you to save business metadata and technical metadata and allows you to link and connect the data together. Um, what I will say is that a lot of data catalogs tend to get blended into broader data governance tools. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go back into kind of our, our vendor soup map. I'm just gonna circle back to this. Okay, so we, we consider ourselves a partner to a lot of catalog companies. And the reason being that a lot of catalogs also come with uh, a set of data governance workflows and data governance dashboards. So if you think about us as more like the analytics engine around the catalog, uh, if you have Kaliba, for example, if you have uh, Informatica Axon, or if you have Erwin or Aqua Data or Alation, we, we play very nicely in the sense that we can clean the data, but then we take the metadata and we populate and we keep those catalogs up and running. If you don't have these types of catalogs, then we make it easy for, for us to just say, look, just stand it up and then you can use uh, classify it as an as your internal catalog. All right. Uh, Frederico asks, are there any price list for this service yet? Uh, we'll describe pricing um, in a little bit more detail. Uh, what I will say is that the pricing model is based on the volume of data that's being processed. So if you're running this thing uh, for like 100 gigabytes, it's going to be way smaller than if you're running this thing for 10 petabytes. But that's the idea is that it's supposed to be uh, Price in a way that makes it easy for you to just scale it up and use it, and you can kind of forecast and manage and control how much the actual cost is going to be. But but it, it's it's proportional to the value that you're getting because you're analyzing, scanning, and cleaning more data. All right, one or two more. Scott asks, how does the machine learning work? Where does the information that trains the model come from? So there's going to be a, so the machine learning. There's two different engines. There's going to be an unsupervised model. And there's going to be a supervised learning model. The unsupervised model is, is basically coming from our past and, and whatever experience that we have. We've built it into this data genome, which is our knowledge graph. And so when you get an instance of Flurry Sense, it'll come prepackaged with a Flurry Sense brain or a data genome based on whichever industry sector, whichever specific uh, relevant uh, information that we can come and kind of bring out of the box. So out of the box, the system will be ready to start running models the second that you turn it on. But then each individual customer's data is always different than any other customers. So that's where the this, this supervised learning kicks in. And the way FlurrySense works is FlurrySense knows how to create training tasks. So it tries to figure out what is the least amount of statistically relevant knowledge I need in order to get smart really quickly. And so it defines these training tasks. And it asks you through a workflow to identify who in the company is best positioned to provide answer these questions. And a lot of these questions are thumbs up, thumbs down questions, match, no match questions. So as you as you farm this out to people in the in the business and the enterprise who know this knowledge, as they give thumbs up and thumbs down, that gets added to the knowledge graph. And that's how the system will continuously reinforce itself and get smarter. 
All right, thank you. And for William, who asked about the summary slide, uh, and for everybody on the call today, we'll be sending along an email with a, with a link to this webinar so you can rewatch it on demand or send along to your colleagues. Uh, and if you want some more information, go ahead and check out Flurry Sense at uh, flurry.ee slash sense. Uh, Elliot, anything more to add? No, I just, uh, if there are any questions, if folks want to do live demonstrations, uh, if you want to start kind of uh, working on some sandbox testing, and if people are interested, uh, you can reach out, I guess, Kevin to yourself or to Scott Benson. Yep. And then what we'd love to do is we'd love to kind of have some phones where we can kind of go and, and dive a little bit deeper. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more questions than we've had the time to take on in today's session. That's right. All right. That concludes our webinar today. Thank you, everybody in the audience for joining us. And thank you, Elliot, for taking the time. Have an excellent rest of your week. All right. Thanks, everyone.